recording. Yes, I like the I, I like that expression. So nice to see you both. A little sarcasm in there. And for people who are just hearing this, you don't know what happened, as you never know what happened before the recording button was pressed. But for the sake of all involved, we're going to, have to be silent about that. It's nice to see you both. It really is nice to see you both. And thanks for coming on. We'll have to do a follow-up, Judy, if you want to have your old podcast and not be overshadowed by this, <laughs> this man front and center. James, there's one problem with me. I don't have an off button. We've got the start and stop for the next <laughs> recording. And you're from holding, that perspective, you're holding the pistol, right? <laughs> that's actually not a problem. It's usually a virtue when people want to talk. The best interviews are the ones where we go in the background and let people say what's on their minds. And depending on what the topic is, that works really well. All right. So... Thanks for staying on for the beginning. Like I, we had asked you, Judy, it's nice for everyone who remembers you to, to see you on face as well. So appreciate it. Okay. So you have every opportunity to talk to the head lawyer now. Thanks. We will. Bye. Say bye, dear. Well, that was, yeah, Judy. She had a great international career. I'm sure like you did, James. And she ended up as the general counsel for the Criminal Court of Arbitration in the uh, Peace Palace next to the World Court. To law school when she was 40 years old. Wow. In Holland, in the Netherlands, in Dutch. Crazy. So Randy was just asking me before we came on, everybody I know has a law degree. Maybe I should become a lawyer as well. You see, Randy, it's not too late. You just need your 50s. Yeah. I'm well, Randy, don't do it. I went your direction, sir. I went into the arts. Oh, really? What, what did you do? I actually, I joined the army and I was a Green Beret for 30 years. But after that, I became a writer and an editor, a freelance writer and editor. Oh, that's wonderful. How do you feel for that transition? I feel like my heart is open and I feel at peace. What's a wonderful story. There was a boy I taught in seventh and eighth grade named Brian Murphy. And Brian Murphy was the sweet, just a wonderful young 12, 13 year old kid, just a wonderful human being. And he had a habit that I don't know why he wasn't murdered by his teachers, when you called on him in class, his answer always was, no matter what teacher or what subject, his answer was, I'm sorry, Brian's not at home. Can I take a message? And that's absolutely true. And he, was a, he wasn't a big seventh or eighth grade. He just was a, just a wonderful boy. He ended up being a rescue, I'm going to say paratrooper, but I don't know what that was. Air Force Pararescue, Air Force Pilots. In the mountains in Switzerland. Wow. And this little boy turned out to be such a brave, strong, wonderful guy. And he was helicoptered up and then would parachute down or whatever they did to rescue people. And it wasn't, I don't think it was civilians. I think it was military. I think that's what he was. The guys that he rescued, the people that he rescued were doing exercise or something in the mountain. So he may have been sick. I don't know that story, but I know that's what he did. And now I think he's 50 years old or something and married and wonderful. And he at completely at peace home in America. Just he's reverted to the, I'm sorry, Brian's not at home person. But he uh, did what you did in a way. Just yeah. went in and then came out. He's now on a ranch, I think. So anyway, that, that's the story. Right, it's an interesting question for someone who sees hundreds and thousands of students over the course of a career. Do you think you can tell that people are destined for a certain type of career or what sort of sense do you get from kids? Or are you constantly surprised about what they end up doing and where the way their lives go? As a teacher, your relationship to the parents and siblings of the student in front of you is different than being a student next, the kid sitting next to you. So when you were in ninth grade, there were students. Your friends were around you. They knew things about you that teachers don't know. They had a different perspective. So how many times was a teacher invited? It's invited to a student's home to see the mom and dad, to see what's, I look behind you and what's hanging on the wall and the environment that you're in right now. I didn't, I'm going to say 99% of the students that I heard had over the years. I didn't see their homes. I didn't see their room, which is very important to a young person growing up, what their room is like. I didn't see whether they loved a certain football team or I didn't see that. What I saw was when the door opened and when the door closed, when it in walks the child out. That's why I love teaching theater so much because the, the theater 
was outside that normal schedule. I never could have, I never, I'm veering off the answer here, but I never could have taught in a regular classroom and, and been in trouble all the time. I, I couldn't stand, I couldn't stand the, the classroom exercises and we're now going to do a diary, take 10 minutes and write down something. That's why I love theater so much. But the answer to your question, so I didn't know what was going on outside. I don't know if you turn the camera around from both of you guys and, and show me where you live. That's what we don't see as teachers. So I don't know how the kids are going to turn out. I, if I know the older brother and then I have the younger brother, then I can get a different picture. If I meet the dad, I had one dad, for example, who said to me, the parents and I, my son, he was in the ninth grade, has chosen the wrong friends, in my opinion. I would like you, please, to keep me informed his behavior in school. And I said, absolutely not. I'm a teacher. I'm not a spy. You're the father. But that's once in my, let's say, all the years. So I don't know how they're going to. It amazes me sometimes that they, what they end up, what you guys end up doing. How did you, if I ask you, how did you do it? When you, did you know when you were 13, 14 years old that you were going to be a lawyer? She said, how did, I always get nervous around people who say things. I knew when I was five years old, I wanted to be a doctor. Yeah. No, you did When I was in eighth grade, it was either going to, I was either going to go to Hollywood or I was going to go in the army. And after I <laughs> decided to join the army. Yeah. You decided that word that you decided. That's a very important word that you decided. Because the you has to be set down. You have to feel like a man. You have to feel like you can, you can decide. And how many times, I read somewhere, question, how many times in your life have you made a good or a bad decision? I didn't even know how many times in my life I made a decision. Did, you, did I decide to get married? Did I decide to have children? Here Most I am. people can look back on probably a handful, four or five important things that happened, and we can argue about whether it was a decision or whether that was just not the end. You're right. Uh, but it's a handful that make a very big difference in people's lives. All right, I'm going to go to this school. I'm going to choose yeah, to work at, exactly. at that company. I'm going to date this person. And then it ends up having a gigantic impact on your life, and you don't realize it. I think a lot of the people that we've talked to, a lot of our classmates, feel like they, they probably weren't the ones deciding to go to Ash. It was a family thing. Their parents oh, no, were there. Oh, no, you're right. You're right. Yeah. But it still had a pretty big impact on many of them. And we remember it vividly all these years later because of the experiences we had while we were there. And of course, a lot of them remember you quite vividly, Richard. And the drama classes were absolutely a, a highlight and a refuge and a haven. It meant different things to different people. And I hope we'll go through some of those experiences today to help people I, yeah, recall their own. It's very true that the students, there are important events, but the big important event I think in a lot of your life, in the life of all the students I taught at, at Ash, was being outside the States and being having the chance to sit down next to somebody who was, came from Peru or somebody who came from, we had Russian students, remember, and Polish. We had East Bloc students who came. We had Indonesia. We, and to sit down with them, that's what I say, and I'll stand by my words. I learned more from my students than they ever learned from me. To be in front of a class, you remember the classes, the students in the American school? It wasn't like just normal kids. You were being carried by your parents country to country. I taught one boy who was, was in... 12th grade and had been in 17th school. His dad worked for Shell Oil and he loved it. He loved it. And I know that girls, for example, who get taken overseas when they're going into eighth grade. So they're in Texas in high school or something, middle school, and their father gets a job overseas. They have a terribly difficult time, the girls at that age, because they're, they're just starting to develop as a, as a female. And suddenly they're in a situation, they always say the same thing. I miss my friends. I miss my friends. And you make new friends. No, you're right. It was very, I'm very happy I had the chance to do that, to teach overseas. I got to go back, not to the beginning, maybe. That would be too far. But 
What were you doing in Holland? How did you make your way there? How'd you make your way to the American School of the Hague? What was the path? Was it decisions? Was it accidents? Okay, it's simple. <laughs> I was finished college and I went to graduate school in Philadelphia. And at graduate school, getting a master's in English, I was interviewed by a man named Jack Cleveland, who was the very serious young man, and maybe in his their 40s, I don't know. And he hired me to be a teacher at a school called the Upland Country Day School in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania. And that was my job. And Judy was still at Bryn Mawr. We were married and had a child. Judy had both children while she was still in college at Bryn Mawr. And we, I was at Haverford. And we moved to Unionville, Pennsylvania. And Unionville, Pennsylvania is a town that's a crossroads. That's it. Maybe 250 people, 300, I don't know. Number one, we were the first Jews they'd ever met in their life. They knew about us from reading, but they never met anybody to shake their hand. And that was very interesting also. And we were young, a young couple with two children, and I was teaching. And Judy was still finishing college. And we had a neighbor, for example, named Mr. Fenstermarker. And Mr. Fenster, every spring, would come into our house and to explain to him, we had five years would explain to us, and he would say, Richard and Judy, do you know how you keep shit out of the kitchen in the springtime? And uh, flies, flies out of the kitchen in the springtime? I said, no. He said, you put a pail of shit in the living room. That was his five-year-long <laughs> joke. And so for us, coming from this intellectual background, we were suddenly in a, in a little town that had a church where they spoke in tongues right across the street, very serious religious village, basically. And it had the Hannum family living there. And the Hannum family was the richest people that I ever met in my life. And they owned the Hannum hounds. And the Hannum hounds was a group of fox hunting hounds. And every spring, I forget, for three weeks or something, people from all over America came to this town with huge trucks and with horses and just bridge people. And they chased foxes for over the place. And at a certain point, five years, Judy said to me, she finished college, said to me, and got a job teaching kindergarten and, and uh, at the same school and said to me, let's get out of here. Let's just get out of here. And she had a notice from Bryn Mawr College bulletin board that said, want to teach overseas? Call this company. Just like that. It wasn't a decision. She said, heard comment, let's get out of here. And this notice in the bulletin board, and I called the company in New Jersey and got an interview. And all of a sudden I was hired. I w we went to your chair at Christmas vacation and I was hired at Christmas time by the superintendent of the American School of the Hague. I'd never been out of the States really. I'd, n I'd never taught overseas. I had no idea what Americans, and it was called at that time, the American School of the American School of the International Schools of the Hague. Tesotis was its initials. And it was joined with the British school. I don't know if you remember the British school and the uh, French school. The German school didn't uh, join. And I went, I was hired at an interview clip. That I walked in the door as a superintendent. He hired me to teach English to seventh and eighth grade and to start a theater program. And the son of a gun had lied to me and told me, we have a big theater program and a theater and everything. And I got there and I took me two seconds to realize they had no theater program. They did one play a year in the high school and that was it. And they had no theater. They rented the theater and I was asked them to start a theater program. So I know nothing. It wasn't like a decision. We decided to get out of Judy, put the pressure on, let's get out of here and try something. We just went there and we went for a year, just one year with our two little boys, six and four and stayed 39. What year was that when you went there? 68. That's the year I was born. Yeah. See, <laughs> and, and so you, I guess to go back to the question, I don't know how many people made the decision to come teach at the American School of the Hague. The kids never, you guys never, you, you were just carried around with your parents, wherever your dad or mom got a job overseas. And if you were in the oil business, you went to Cardin, Indonesia first. Maybe you went to Norway, to Stavanger, where the oil fields were. Maybe you worked for a big company that pipelines. The kids were moved. 
I knew families, or maybe you knew families, that never unpacked their trunks. They would put the trunk in the living room and cover it with a rug they got in Afghanistan to make it look like a piece of furniture, but it really was the trunk they moved in. You know what I mean? It, how do so, you guys, you, we've been talking about choices. And one of the things that I learned when I started, I got my MFA in creative writing and, and that, well, I was still in the military. And then I started freelance editing writing when I got out in 2018. And one of the things I started learning was what makes books interesting is every chapter has a choice for the character because the choices in the character's life show the reader what kind of person that character is, as opposed to showing, tell, showing versus telling. And I would say the same thing happens for us. Like, yes, I didn't have a choice whether I was going to go to Holland or not, but I had a choice what classes I was going to take. Most of the time, most of us do. Maybe the parents, yeah. but you also have a choice whether you want to apply, whether you want to study or not, or you want to go down to the beach every day or go to the arcade or go to the bowling alley or whatever. So you have choices that impact your life, small, little by little, I think. And I also think our choices and our characters revealed by not everyone noticed that notice on the bulletin board at Britain Bar, want to teach overseas. And the person who notices it is the person who makes the decision to then go. Not everyone, of course, but it's little things. When I was in Frankfurt, I first, after I finished school, came back in the U.S. for college, I got itchy feet relatively quickly and wanted to move overseas again. It was just weird being in the U.S. And I thought, ah, I got to find a way back overseas. So I, I went and worked for a law firm in Frankfurt, Germany. And that was supposed to be a three-year stint. I had just gotten married before moving overseas. My wife had never been overseas, so it was a big move for her. And yeah. We were near year two of that stint, and I saw an ad in the Wall Street Journal about a <laughs> job in Switzerland. And I looked over to my wife and said, hey, you want to live in Switzerland for a while? And it was really no, as exactly as you said, Richard, no grand plan, no vision no, whatsoever no as to how this would turn out. It was just a, a little notice caught my eye, and then your life unfolds as a result in unpredictable ways, but also wonderful. And I think maybe coming back to my question to you before, everyone has potential in them. And you might see pieces of what a kid is good at and what they like and what they do, but that doesn't tell you anything about the way their life is going to unfold because no. of unpredictable random choices. Someone gets, doesn't see that notice on the bulletin board because they were distracted by a girl walking by. And right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. They never leave the U.S. And how interesting and weird is that? Very. And to go to your compatriot here, who's a writer, I believe, I don't know if he'll agree with me. That at a certain point in writing, let's say a story, a fictional story, at a certain point in writing that he's writing and he's got notes down in front of him and he's making decisions what the character is going to say and do, at a certain point in that, he is going to write something down that the character says or does that he didn't know. The character does it. And that I believe in a certain point as a creative writer, as a creative painter and artist, the thing that they're creating takes over from them. They, so, you can't ask him, why did you do that in chapter three? Or why did you have the character say that? He, I don't think he can know. Suddenly in your life, do you know what's going to come? My father used to say to me, think before you speak. I never met anybody in my life. <laughs> but they spoke in a way. But at a certain point, the artist in him takes over. He's got to release himself. He's got to get out of the story, out of the, what he's writing. And the character has his own life. So, so yeah. You're right. The best authors understand their characters at a really deep level. They understand what kind of people they, they've created. And then when you put them in the situation, instead of what would Jesus do, it's like, what would my character Mac Ivan do? Because this is his history. These are traumas he's been through in his life. So in this situation, what would he do? Not what would I do, the writer, but what would my character do? Because I I have a deep relationship with that character. The best writer would do that. And that's exactly. what I try to teach other authors. Right. Well, exactly. But you say that, but I think that the character decides, not you. Yeah. You don't say, oh, what would I do? No, oh, what, 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 what am I going to make him do? He's right. going to decide. And at that point, the piece of art is, in, in a, to use a funny expression, it's not in your control. I can't ask you, why did your character say that? I believe that once that story rolls, that character has a life and you throw situations in, maybe you have a grand plan where, where it's going to happen, what's going to happen next. 
But in fact, in a crazy way, if you're good, that character has a real life. And it's not, you can't look back at it and go, my God, I created a real person. It's a real human being that you've cr created, right? So yeah. that's true about the writing you do. It's true about your own life, personally. In, do you know, did I know what I was going to say or do at a certain point? Life threw things at me, right? Like at you. And you have to respond the way you are. But who knows? <laughs> if someone said you write down in a piece of paper exactly who you are and why you do things, you'd end up with a blank piece of paper. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Judy's leaving. Judy's going to work. All right. So uh, I forget where we were, we were at. I loved, I loved the teaching at the school. I loved the kids. I, I ended up after 39 years there. Uh, one of the girls that I was teaching said to me at a certain point, she was a senior. She ended up being a professional stage manager and uh, in New York. And she said to me, I never want you to, while I'm working with you, this is a 17 year old girl. I never want you to repeat a play. Always challenge yourself. See, thank you. Thank you for teaching me something. Right. We were, we, I don't know. No, it's okay. You keep on giving us interesting sidebars to pursue. And Reggie and I are always happy to do that because that's where the interesting stuff is. And discussion, both of you, about the creative process and what happens when you are working with a character or a story. I didn't have the same experience as what you just described, but I had a, a related one, I think. And I never knew what it meant to be inspired by a muse until I was in my last six months of work and I was knew I was going to retire. And I started writing on the side myself. And I wrote what was interesting to me at the time. I wrote a modern version of sending moral letters to Lasilius. Oh, wow. So he's got 124 letters. They encapsulate what a very brilliant man understood of Stoic philosophy at the time. And by writing them in a modern voice, what I thought was my voice, I was trying to understand Stoic philosophy and bring it over to younger people who maybe didn't have the historical references. I really got into it. And for every day for three months, I would write one or two letters. And about halfway through, I had a very strange feeling. It really did feel weird to me. I felt like, hey, wait a minute. I'm not actually in charge of this thing anymore. I feel like Seneca is channeling through me. And that sounds stupid and grandiose, but it really did feel to me that way, that I didn't have full control of this thing. That I, and I know it's just because I was spending a lot of time with it and working on it every day and thinking about it, but it still was a very interesting feeling. So I could totally understand the idea of a writer having a character that they spent tons of time with feeling like that character does take on an independent life of their own and that you're just bringing that creature, helping yeah. them in, into the world, but not necessarily creating such an interesting process. And probably creating a play must feel like that as well, right? Because you don't, staging a production, right? You've got all these different kids and elements and things coming in. Of course, you've got a script, you've got the lines, you know exactly how it's supposed to go. But I bet even if you put on the same play five times, it was never the same play. Never. And, it, and that's the difference in movies and theater. Mm -hmm. Because in movies, they just go cut, edit, cut, edit. What do they say in Hollywood? They save one foot of film for every 30 or 40 they throw away. So they, they get exactly, they can do the same shot with 10 cameras and choose camera number three for the first part of the speech and camera number four for the second part. So... You can't do that on the stage. And on this, on the, I always felt that, let's say high school students, they're going through a change in their life. High school is a four hard years in a crazy way. You're not expected to, but all of you high school kids, they have jobs after school, they play sports, they go to theater, they play in a band, they belong to student government, and they have classes, and they're expected when the bell rings to go out of English class, period one, to walk down the hall to the second class, period two, and the bell rings and they have to, they were in a French class. And you're expected as a student to go eight periods in a day, whatever it is. Oh, now I'm in the math mode. Oh, bing, bing. Oh, now I'm in the French mode. And you're expected to achieve changes constantly. And then you have theater in which you have to be a different person. And the definition I always would say to them, then the definition of acting is reacting. You react and I react to things in life just because it's you. How you say it, how you see it, it's you. And now I say to you, you're 17 years old or 16 years old, and I want you to do a, a, 
comedy in which you play a 60-year-old man who can't tie his shoes anymore. And you've got to walk out of your academic classroom into the, onto the rehearsal stage. And you've got to somehow transport yourself. I never understood how you all did it into this other character. And you have to react to the other characters, your buddies in school, as your character to that character. It's very difficult. It was, and it was, you guys would shine. I loved high school theater. I loved to watch high school theater and to know what you were going through in your own life and the kind of pressures on you to grow up and whatever that means. And then you were acting. Some of you were so good. I was sitting backstage and I'd watch and my God, this kid is wonderful. And some went on to acting to big time. Brendan Fraser, right? Brendan Fraser thanked me, said to me, because I cast him as a village idiot in one of the fifth grade plays or something he did, that make prepared him for George of the Jungle. Under the jungles. Where year did he go? He's younger than me. Oh, oh, I listen, I don't have any idea how old James is, for example. I don't know when he was at Ash. I don't know any of that. I never understood that. I know today is Friday, but I'm just not sure. You know, I never knew. I'm amazed that some of the kids right now are 60 years old that I took. You're 60 years old? You're, you're 18. I said, I can't get it in my head. I'd never been able to do that. I had no idea what year James was in the school. I had no idea how old he is or anything like that. So I don't know. James, I, when were you at school? To be fair, you had a pretty long tenure at Ash, almost 40 yeah. years. And by God, by the way, why didn't you make it to 40? Who goes to 39 and then stops? Don't you have a sense of... I was 65 years old. And the yeah. school had a policy that you have to retire. Yeah. And the question was, was a double question. One, when is your birthday? Because if I was a Dutch person and turned 65 on, let's say, April 3rd, that's the day I would retire. You don't go to the end of the school year. And as, as an American, I stayed the whole year. And then the question is, what am I going to do? Because they say you have to retire. and I said that I would like to stay on and slowly prepare the next teacher, stay another year, because Judy had not retired yet. Judy's younger. And I said, I want to wait for Judy. What can I do? And they said, that we, you can't. Retire is retire. So I left teaching when I was 65 years old, just because of the rule that at 65, you have to stop teaching. I looked at the end of that year. Okay, that answers that question. And to yeah. answer your question, I was there in the 80s, 1981 to 96. And it was, for me, eighth grade through senior year. And, yeah, uh, you were there a long time. Absolutely formative time, of course, to be there. And I found, with all of the other things going on that you described well about all sorts of stuff going on Everything. in kids' life, theater was such a refuge, right? It was the place where you could try on different personas. And not only was it just an experiment, it was expected. In order to succeed, you had to embrace 100 Now I'm going to be Dogberry. Now I'm going to be Jesus Christ Superstar. Now I'm going to be Ossorn or whatever it was. And they were all different, but you could practice figuring out not just how to do the role well, but indirectly, of course, who the heck you were as a person. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe the combination of doing theater at that age when kids are anyway in turmoil and there's lots going on. That's why some seem to take to it and why it's so meaningful to them. Did you keep teaching English for very long or what other subjects did you teach or how did it evolve for you over the years? I taught English for, let's say, I'm going to say maybe three, maybe four years. And then the theater program, I just started doing real plays. I said, you're not doing real plays. And they, this and I started the first play that I did was the wonderful musical, The Fantastics, because they didn't have a theater. And I just wanted to get something exciting going in the beginning. And I actually got hate mail in the mail from students and parents saying, you're not, we don't do musicals in our school. You know, okay, okay we're going to do the Fantastics. And then we get a, a lot of support from the principal of the school and from the superintendent. And that gave me the strength to, let's say, continue. And you know how it ended up. It ended up so that the school built a 400 seat, what they call diplomatic theater, where President C, two presidents, Bush 
And also Bill Clinton came and played saxophone in the jazz band. We had a foreign seat. It looked, it was absolutely professional theater with an orchestra pit and everything and a huge lighting inside. And I designed the theater and gave that when I left. That was my legacy to Ash, let's say. This mm -hmm. theater, the American School Theater Program. No, yeah. I don't know. I lost my track there. Yes. I asked you what you had taught, how long you taught English. And it's it clear that very, the theater. Very theater. Clear. Once the theater program started, once the American, the, what makes an American school different overseas? You, you were in The Hague for five years. The American School of The Hague, the British School, the French Lycée, the Deutsche, the German School. There's an Indonesian school that was, and it's still today, Indonesian school, the Russian school because the Russians had their own private school, Chinese school. And now, so it didn't happen when you were there, there's something called the International School. The International School of the uh, ISH versus AS. I went there. Yes. Oh, you did too. I so went there for two years and I went to The Hague for three years. Okay. So the International School and the American School of the Hague, why was there an international school? Because a lot of the parents that were being sent after oil industry changed it were diplomats from the east poland and hungary and czechoslovakia when it was czechoslovakia and there was no place for them in that culture to study at an american english french or german school and the city of the hague made many comments to the american school british school french school the first and german the four that they couldn't allow the city of the hague public school teachers to be faced with a population of kids that came in from Texas or Moscow for three months, one year, two years and a half. They had no idea how long they were going to be there with no Dutch language and they'll be put into a normal Dutch classroom. The teachers would never get anything accomplished, never. And so they supported international education very strongly and created the international school as well so that it could pick up that group of students. It was important that each school had its own personality. And what makes American education different all over the world is the, not just the sports, but it's the arts. How important band was and choral music was and dancing was and theater was. And we even had at the American School of Hague, I don't know if you were there, Jane, at that time, Home economics. We actually had kids who they had to cook. They had to sew a pillow. Had, we were talking about that actually before we started. Randy was saying he didn't learn how to boil an egg. I don't know how he managed yeah. to make it through. But the, no, but it, how Judy, my wife, Judy, she works with university students now. And she works with young people becoming lawyers. One of the neighbors in a building where we live had a young daughter who is now a lawyer and doing very well, blah, blah, blah. But. When she was in high school, she wanted to apply to college, and Judy helped her with the, how to do the application. She, she was from the Dominican Republic, and her English won of everything. She had never seen or understood an envelope. She didn't know what you, what, what's a stamp for. She didn't know how to address an envelope, where to put your home address and return address, and how to address. She'd never seen that. She'd never written a check. You say, oh my God, it's so basic. You don't know how to write an envelope. And they don't. And they sometimes I think now a younger generation even, they don't even know this is a pencil. All they know is press still spell check. And that's that becomes okay. yeah, that could become a problem. But the the idea that we had home economics and we had in the American school also a country luncheon every year with a the diplomatic families would cook and bring food of that country. And the, the wives of the ambassadors, whoever, maybe the woman was an ambassador, would wear the clothes of the country. So the regular kids going back and forth from classes would see these spectacularly dressed South Koreans. And in front of them, for example, a beautiful big dish of South Korean food. We taught the kids to be open for, open for that. And in the theater, I did Greek plays. I did one play in the theater with another teacher helping me that was a, a play called Mountain Language. I recommend it to both of you. Very short play by Harold Pinter. And Mountain Language is the story of the oppression of the Kurdish people by the Turks. And it's a violent 
play, but very short lines. There's no long speeches. Shut up. Don't speak your language. And they had to speak the language that was forced on them. And it takes place in a prison where a man is being tortured and interviewed by the oppressors who will not allow him to speak his own language. And I asked the students in the high school, translate this very simple, very short, simple play that's maybe 30 minutes, 40 minutes long into your language. And I had copies done, but in Arabic, in Dutch, in Arabic, in Hebrew, in German, in French, in Spanish, in Korean. Yeah, of course, in English. And I told the students and I told all the parents when they came to watch the play when it was finally done, I want you to speak the line in your language, but you're going to only speak the lines in your language, which means if you're Korean, you're going to say to the prison guard, please don't hurt me anymore. And the prison guard is going to speak in his language, German, back to you, because that's the way the world is. That's the way the world is. You speak in your language and the other people have to speak your language or they speak the translation into you. you. You've been through that in your life, that, that you don't understand Korean language. What's the point of someone speaking Korean to you? And I did it that way. And then at the very end, they all spoke in English. And at one point in the rehearsals, a Korean boy, a high school senior, came with his sister to an evening rehearsal, and he played the part of the prison guard, and he had to speak very strongly to the mother of the prison prisoner, played by an old lady who spoke Spanish. He had to say to her something like, shut up, speak my language, very aggressive like that. And out of his mouth would come, please be quiet. And I said to him, listen, you're a prison guard. For God's sakes, be aggressive, be strong, make it scary. And his sister said, excuse me, I didn't know her. She wasn't in the school. She was like 20 years old or something. Excuse me, she said, sir, in Korea, we are not allowed to raise our voice to people who are older than us. What? That was a revelation to me. Like I was stupid. I never even thought about that. He, his culture would not let him do that. And that's the experience that you guys had overseas, I believe. I believe that changed your lives to me. When I... When I listened to Randy discuss how he navigated his military career, it clearly shows to me, Randy, I don't think we've talked about this, that you are very culturally adept, right? You were perfectly happy at the idea of picking up another language and taking even rudimentary skills and then just working on it. And then all of a sudden you're the most qualified person at your rank or no, and it, it happened many times. You, you, you studied all sorts of different languages. You felt yourself if not at home, then certainly capable of operating in all sorts of different environments, which if you think about it is extremely unusual and not at all very expected. Do you think that that happened not just because of Ash, it happened because of your nomadic upbringing, but yeah. Ash and the experiences students had at Ash was absolutely part of that, right? That people were moving around. You were definitely confronted with the melting pot of people and ideas and cultures. And to its credit, Ash encouraged that, right? We had so many opportunities to celebrate other people's cultures. What you mentioned, also things like Model UN, where deliberately you bring in thousands of kids from all over the world. And now, hey, look, you're going to, you're going to represent your country. And here is just the, I don't know if that we worked any better than the real UN, but it was still. I'd say that I was a dumb kid back then. And while I now probably more than the average American love plays and musicals, and I ended up going, graduating high school in London, so I was more exposed to it there. I didn't enjoy drama in ninth grade with you, sir. It was forced on me. It wasn't a choice of mine. I think it was a mandatory class, right? And but it was I was shy, and, and you put me in uh, our town, so it was a love story. The yeah. girl I didn't know because I was new to the school, and so I wasn't. I was like, yeah, I don't want to do this ever again. I also didn't learn how to cook in home economics and I didn't learn how to shop in shop because I made a sword, which may have been why I went in the military. I don't know. One thing I did appreciate, not at the time, but I love the travel part. And when I was a kid, I don't think I, I don't think I appreciated it enough. My parents would take me places on the weekends, sports teams, we'd go to other places. It was just my life and I didn't appreciate it as much as I probably should have. But when I thought about joining the army after one year of college, it was because I wanted to travel. And exactly. that, that's where I went that direction. Also, I sucked at languages in high school. I took two years of Spanish, two years of Dutch, three years of French, and I never 
I couldn't speak a word of any of them when I got out of high school. Now I speak fluent Spanish, the rudimentary French and okay Portuguese. But yeah, I, I don't, I think I didn't know what I had when I was in Holland until later. And I really appreciated it and I wanted to go back to it. And I really, the drama would have helped me a lot in my army career, I really believe. Probably home economics and shop too. My, I was telling the story of my wife today before our interview, how I made a uh, sword and shop and I didn't really learn how to hammer a nail or anything. And she's like, and the yarn, can't do anything around the house. And I was like, right. here you go. And she and I was like, as a matter of fact, home economics wasn't very helpful either. Like, and here we are, can't cook anything. And, uh, but I do think later in life, especially in my military career, what I ended up doing at the end was a lot of human intelligence and stuff like that. Yeah. It's been very beneficial. Yeah. But you say that when you talked about the language you, you speak, so you speak English, but you still don't, don't talk about how good you speak English, Spanish, French, and Portuguese. Okay. How good isn't to me interesting. Judy, for example, in her work at the, in the United Nations at the Peace Palace. She had to work, and her secretary had to work in English, Dutch, German, and French. You have to. That's basic. That means you have to be able to read and to write and even to speak. And she also studied Chinese, and she also speaks Greek, and she wow. still can do Hebrew. And our, our sons went to Dutch school, went to Dutch school, and they walk out of school speaking, speaking, reading, writing English, Dutch, German, and French. Bingo. And then Michael did Latin or whatever, and Tyler. But you, like an actor, okay, when you were sitting with a, let's say, a Portuguese, you said you are okay in Portuguese, you have to, your brain has to work really fast to suddenly think and speak Portuguese with a Portuguese person. You, you know what I mean? It's wonderful to me. It's wonderful. wonderful. And then people can, I tell everybody, I speak five languages, English, American, Canadian, New Zealand, and South Africa. Australia, South Africa, and I get and those five languages. I can get around the world, right? But you have the ability, and I of course speak Dutch. But you have the ability to uh, act to play. You you can speak those languages. I to me, I think it's a great strength. And I I, I also I grew up in a, Iran uh, before the cool. revolution, so I learned a little bit of Farsi. And the Iranian Farsi is different than the Afghan. Farsi, which they call it. It's not, it's similar. It's different like Spanish, Spain, Spanish, and South American Spanish kind of thing. So they have different words and stuff. So I've spent three years in Iran, like third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade. And then I got evacuated out. I live in Holland. I live in England and went to college during the army. And then in 2002, I ended up in Afghanistan where they speak Farsi. And, but I, so I, so it's coming back to me, plus I was studying it before I went. And so the translators are translating and the translators have never, never met anyone, Americans who spoke Farsi. And I didn't tell them I spoke Farsi because I wasn't really, I wasn't really competent, but I could understand what they were saying. And I was like, that's not what we told you to tell them. What do you mean, sir? I was like, we told you to tell them this and you beat around the bush and said something else. How would you know that? I speak a little Farsi. Like, no, you don't. I would rattle off with something and they're like, oh, shoot, I guess we need to do our job. So that was, uh, that was really my language thing. Well, and then later on, I told, I told J James this once, I had a job opened up in Holland at the end of my career. And I was at the Sergeant Major Academy, the Dutch Sergeant Major Academy as an exchange instructor. And the U.S. military has no one that speaks Dutch, except for the one guy that was, I was going to replace because he was half Dutch. And, and so I was like, all I had to do was get like a really low score in this test <laughs> to the army that I had some inclination in Dutch. This is what, this is what I was thinking in my head. I was like, no one speaks Dutch. So if I just take this test and just get, if I get a 50% on the test, then, the, then I'll prove to someone that I have Dutch and then they'll notice me. And so I did it and I actually applied for the job and I didn't get the job. I got a job in Italy instead. And I was six months out from moving and I was in, I was in Kuwait at the time. And I get a, I get an email from the headquarters of the army who is in charge of HR and assigning people. And he's, they're like, Hey, you're the only American of this rank with this profession that speaks, that has a Dutch score. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and right. 
I was like, yes, I am. And just my idea worked, but I already got a sign somewhere else. I'm sorry. So I guess yeah. that's yeah, t- so, very typical. I yeah. taught a, a family, brother and sister, Matt and Cynthia Hoy, H-O-Y-E, whose mm-hmm. dad was the editor of the Aramco House newspaper. So a big job. And Eileen was absolutely, when you look at her today, and she's, I'm sure, 60, 50 maybe. She was at high school age, the actual picture of an Irish milkmaid, white skin, freckled, just a beautiful young girl, Irish looking, quick. Her dad and family was sent to, I'm going to say Iran, and the revolution came and they had to flee their home. And Eileen told me, I, she told her story, she remembers as a young girl holding in the truck, in the army truck, being driven at speed. We got to get out of the house now. We need to go now and we're getting out of here. And the troops all around to make, protect the family. And the soldier running out of the house and throwing a, a doll or a toy bear into her arms that she held backwards as the truck zipped fast away. She comes to the American, they come to the hall and go to the American school to Ash and her school to Hague. And she likes to play sports. And now she's a high school kid. She's older. And everybody loved her, except nobody wanted to room with her when they went on sports trips. Because the experience, that experience of being frightened and running away changed her. At night when she slept, she had nightmares, even as a 10th grader. And she would shout out in Arabic. And it came out of her sleeping in Arabic, these frightening things. And the kids were said they were afraid to sleep in the room with her. She didn't know what she, she was doing. So that experience that you have picking up the language and so forth, it, it goes into you, right? It goes into you. It's not something that like you can pick it off a shelf. It's inside you. And I applaud that. Bravo. Bravo. I taught kids. I, you teach sometimes students who at the age of 10 speak five languages, mom's language, dad's language, and the languages of their grandparents. All you can do is bow down. <laughs> yes. Uh, you are my master. I'm trying to remember the, the drama students from when I went, which James, I think was in every play for ninth and 10th grade. Yeah. At Bonnie I Newman. All the way to well, Bonnie Newman was like a year ahead of us, I think. And she was in I'm like, still, I still contact with her. There's a big time in education now in, I think it's, I'm going to say North Carolina. Yeah. And she lectures and she's, I, I don't think she's teaching anymore. She teaches teachers. She was, oh, spectacular person, spectacular young girl in high school. Yeah. So you were there then. I watched all, I would participate. we got all the humorous roles. I remember he had a window washing role one time where he just made strange faces. It was awesome. It was great. I don't know. What were you in, James? My very first role was Don Barry in Midsummer Mid- Night's Dream. Was that it? Um, yeah. And that um, was eighth grade. That was eighth grade. Exactly. exactly. You took the trip to Shakes to Stratford to see. Uh, yeah, exactly. And it was all uphill from there. It was my my place uh, for then all of my years at hand. I had some you fun. Think that Midsummer Night's Dream. What I did was I sat at home and I translated, I rewrote the entire play to put it into more modern English, let's say, because I, I, the idea was I wanted, my job was to get you to feel what the play is like and hopefully you would see that play. And you always saw, I think, two plays and you'd see that play in Stratford when you're, and you'd know, oh yeah, yeah, it wasn't the real, but good for you. And then what did you do after that? I don't know if I remember all of the plays, but we did Jesus Christ Superstar. Yeah. yeah. It'll come back to me if we keep talking about it. But there was, you had also asked, I think I saw on Facebook for help in trying to recreate what plays were done in what years. Yeah. Now it's tough, right? It's a lot of years. It's a lot of years back as well. What's your guess about how many plays and musicals you put on over the years? Okay. Not a big hundreds, right? Because in the high school, we did a musical and a straight play every year. So that's four times, basically four, let's just say 36 something. I, I didn't start right. Oh no, I started from the beginning. So four times 39 years just in the mm-hmm. high school. And that doesn't include my regular high school classes. And the middle school in fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, 
I had the children write their own plays. And we did four plays a quarter. So 16 plays a year times 39. So Holy it counts. Cow. All that comes up. It's the, a, lot a, lot of play, of yeah, a lot of plays. A lot of plays. And some of the kids want to, some, I'm very proud that what some students have done. One, one Swedish girl ended up being the national costume designer for the Swedish National Ballet and the Swedish National Theme Park. She could, she could make anything. I had one girl from Brazil, one girl from Brazil who could make anything you asked her to make. She, I, it just came out of nowhere. And she could just make a crown for King Henry. She could make a, a rocking chair. Yeah. I don't know. And she would never take second. She would always insist that I demand from her the best. She would say to me, I want more to do what I want it to be harder. And when she was a high school senior, her mother was, Port was Brazilian. She was Brazilian and her dad was English. And it happens to be in London every year, a senior trip to London. And the London School of D Dramatic Arts, so Roddy, it's called, Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts, they have a, uh, a section of prop making. and. I called, just sitting in The Hague, I just called the director of the Rada. He's some famous, important guy. I got his secretary and I said, well, you learn a lot of German directors. And I have a student that I'd like to have applied to your school. She said, I don't know, sir, this is very unusual. I said, is there any way that we could have an interview? Or I just made it up. I just was lying like a that. And, and I got the teacher. Yeah, yeah. I got the director on the phone. And he, one of these he very English, but you walk in, I go to help you. But he said, all right, if you're in London, come on over. That was all I needed. So her mother was a chaperone on the trip. And while the students went to the fog, the British Museum or something, I went in a taxi with her mother and Michelle, her name was, and me, the three of us, to the Rada. Walked in the door to this most important school, and she had under her arm the photographs and, uh, and drawings of the things that she'd done in high school for me. Walked in, there's this receptionist. She, yes, sir, can I help you, sir? And I said, we're here for our appointment. I had no appointment. I had nothing. Zero. All I had was him telling me, if you're in London, come on. She said, really? I No, sir, I don't have it in his book. In his appointment is not done yet. We're here. He told us to come. She gets on the phone. Three minutes later, a man comes down the stairs who obviously is the man, and he's an angry man. What are you doing? Who are you? What are you doing? I said, sir, I'm sorry. You told me I spoke to you. Oh, I remember. I said, the girl is right here, and her mother, she's Brazilian. Maybe you could take a look, and it's all wrong, right? And boy, he was angry. And she was a 17-year-old girl. I remember that. And he took us to a room that had a table and a couple of chairs. It was a meeting room. And show me what you're having. I mean, he was angry. And she put the portfolio in front of him and he opened it up like this. And this is what happened. Oh, no. Did you do this? And she said, yes. Okay. Did you do this? And they accepted her. The youngest student they'd ever accepted into Royal Academy Dramatic Arts, 17 year old girl. He took her right then and there. And she went four years to the Royal Academy Dramatic Arts. She went back to Brazil and her career was making props. And the Brazilian television industry is one of the biggest ones in the world. She ended up doing props. And that, I don't know. I went home and Judy said, have a drink. Why didn't he punch you? He should have just punched you in the face. But she failed the two weeks in London. Because she did. Yeah. She, she did. Yeah. She, she, and the rest of the, she and her mother was kept saying, pulling in my jacket and saying, we have to leave. We have to leave. I should know that. And I remember exactly him going, did you do that? She was spectacular. Michelle Sugden, her name was. Her. Well, that's a great story. Yeah, it is. And true. The best ones uh, are always. Richard, you, something I took away from my years doing plays, which helped me a lot later in life, is the audience doesn't know what's coming. And therefore, your job as the actor is to never let them know if things are going according to plan or not. It's just, this is what we're doing now. And I nonetheless would like to understand from you if there are any mishaps that stand out as strongly as the successes that you've already described. Is there oh, anything yeah. you remember from all those years where that things just went terribly, horribly, passionately wrong? And what'd you do? And okay, the best example I can give you is we did The Miracle Worker, uh, the story of Helen Keller. And the girl who played, who did the part of Annie Sullivan, the teacher, you remember the play ends with, uh, with a pump. 
and Helen, and Andy Sullivan forcing Helen Keller's hand, little girl, she was eight or nine at the time, or whatever, into the water coming out of the pump and putting it in a pitcher. So she's feeling it with blind because she couldn't see or remember Helen Keller. And, and then Annie constantly in her hand that was free, spelling the word water, whoa. And Helen Keller going, whoa. Like, and she suddenly spoke. She understood. Okay, we did the play. And the girl playing the part of the teacher as a girl named Fiona Gelderman. She was a Dutch girl at the school. And Fiona Gelderman is now a PhD. She's a doctor specializing in the study of green turtles in the Caribbean. And the last night of the play, the girl playing Helen Keller had in her hand a, a ceramic pitcher into which the water was pouring from the well. And she moved her hands that close, the two actresses, the two girls, close, and she moved her hand with the pitcher, water, and hit the girl playing Helen Kel playing the teacher, Right in the nose and broke her nose. <laughs> and the play had three minutes to go. That was it. It was the last three minutes. And the blood. And I'm backstage. I don't know what's happening. And suddenly, this girl runs off the stage, Fiona Gelderman, with a... <laughs> and I'm backstage. And I should, I'm taking paper towels. What happened? Well, well, what's going on? I don't have any idea what's going on on the stage. Because she just left quickly. And she yells at me. This 18-year-old girl yells at me. Hurry up, damn it. I have to get back on stage. And, so, and she put and paper tells, I don't remember anymore. And she goes back on the stage <laughs> and I call her father. And her father comes and he meets her at the end of the play. That was a real big mishap. But they just kept on doing it. Nobody in the audience knew. I don't know. If you ask me with a pistol to my head, I don't know what happened. How the hell did those students, how did they find the courage and the the ability to remain in character and to continue doing that play, that was, I put that in my great success, although it was a mishap to her. And there's no way I can say to them, I never asked them, what did you do, Dale? What happened when you saw the blood and the girl running off stage? Did you make up lines? Oh, she must have gone to get a bourbon and soda or something. How did, they, how did you get out of that? I was, I never to this day know what happened. I would say that was a mishap. One play that I wanted to do and never was allowed to do was a play called The Dark of the Moon. And it's a play written by an American professor at University of, not Texas, but Kentucky or Tennessee, about the Appalachian people who believe that the vapor, the, uh, the Ozark Mountains, because of the way they, the Ozark Mountains, where they are and how big they are, whatever, Certain times of the year or the day, there's mist on the top of the mountains. So the mountain will be clear, but on the top there's mist. And the Ozark ancient tradition is that those mists become, when they come down to the earth, they become witches. You must keep away from those. Oh. And he wrote a play about a witch boy who comes to earth and falls in love with an earth girl. So let's say 18 year old. And the result is that they're going to get married, but she is outcast from the village because they know it's a witch boy and he's in trouble. I don't remember exactly the detail of that. There's a scene in the church where the folks of the village make her come forward and kneel down in front of the minister and say, you have made a mistake and we want to welcome you back. You must get married. You must get married. Will someone marry you? And one of the her high school boyfriend stands up and says, I'll marry her. And at that point in the play, the witch boy is looking outside and it, it turns out well. But the community, the church-going community in, in The Hay understood that I had, was doing this play and said to me very strongly, if she marries that high school boy and we know she's already married, whatever way, to the witch boy, it's... What do you call it when you're married to two different people? You, one marriage is wrong. Yeah, you mar already married and you get married again. That you can't, she can't get married. There's a word for that. Where you're a married person and you don't tell anybody and you marry somebody else. And bigamy? Bigamy. Thank you. And she, they say, if you do that play, because this is bigamy, if you do that play, we are going to have people in the audience, parents, who are going to stand up and shout 
this is bigamy, this is against God's law, whatever. And they threatened, one person threatened me that if you do this play, wag that finger in my face, which nobody likes. You want the end of your career to be like this, and it's going to be the end of your career. And I went home and I said, this is frightful because they're misreading the play. This is a famous American play written by a professor in the place where it happened. It's been acted by colleges and universities. It's high schools. It's it's a famous play. And they're misreading it through their own. It's not encouraging bigamy. It's talking about another culture and what's allowed. Dave, you understand though, Randy, that it was threatening, physically threatening, and it was threatening psychologically. And I went to the superintendent of schools and I told him, my God, you're being threatened. What do you want to do? He asked me. And I have to think, I went home and had a big talk with Judy and talked about it. And I decided this, what do I have as a high school teacher giving a project that I'd chosen to act out a famous play and allow kids who are 14, 50, up to 18 years old, acting the pad that they give them in the play and some adult stands up and points a finger at them with the audience, you are hurting God, God is against you. How can I do that to a person? They're young, they're young children. They're not adults yet. You're only an adult when you're 18. Knowing that this is going to happen, how can I do that to the kids? And I decided I can't. I'm not going to, this is not going to become a matter of great people. But these children don't need it. They're in, like James said, you're in theater for the enjoyment and then it satisfies your soul to be in theater and then to stand up there and have adults in public point that finger and yell at you, you're not guilty. You're acting a part. So I decided I had already chosen the cast and I decided I was going to change everything. And I took the Greek tra- trilogy, the tragedy of Orestes and Oedipus, I'm sorry, Oedipus, where he blinds us of that Greek tragedy. And I made it at home hard and fast into three one-act plays. Act one was him blinding himself to the whole business with the Sphinx. And then act two was Antigone. And act three was the end of it. And I made that into a Greek play. And I said to the kids, I want to have a meeting with you to discuss what I've done. And I, I called the meeting and the cast arrived after school one day and the superintendent school and the chairman of the arts department came and the high school principal. And they stood in the back of the room. Between them and me were the kids, 21 and kids. And I said to them, I cannot do this. I didn't tell them I'd been threatened. What I said was, there's members of the community that do not want this play to appear. And they made it very clear to me and to the school that if you act this play, if the play goes on the stage, they're going to make public comments from the audience that it is a, 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 an anti-religious and anti-God play. And I'm sorry, I can't do that. And I'm not going to do that. That's not the point of my program. It's not the point of you in high school, some of you seniors who've been in every single play. So I have chosen to do something different. And I explained what it was. And I said, I'm going to, I, I'm not going to do auditions. I'm just going to assign you because you've already been accepted into this cast. I'm going to assign you different parts to play in this. And I have chosen a young Danish girl whose name is Sigurd Jakobsen, who played guitar and is a, was a poet, to write a song for each of the, uh, that will summarize in her vision what the act is about. And that's what I want to do. I said, don't be angry, whatever I said. And the boy who was, had the lead in the play, Nathan Hamilton, a Mormon boy, red hair, freckled, blue eyes, from Salt Lake City, Nathan Hamilton said, stood up, 18 years old, and turned to the principal, the superintendent, and the head of the arts department, and then to me and the kids and said, I've been in this school since I was in the seventh grade, and I have been asked to read literature and to write essays on topics in books that offended me and my religion deeply that have bothered my family, that have insulted, and I I can't forget, I can't remember all of the words. And I have done it. I have written the essays and read the books. And now to be told that I can't do this is very, I can't remember his words, 
It, it's hard. And he sat down. And I'm standing alone with the kids and then the big chiefs at the end. And I said, Jesus, this kid, he sums everything up that's important in the world. Everything. He's a genius. I, I, I love this. Shot. I'm going to marry this kid. I don't know. He's wonderful. And, and I kept, I kept keep, keep in contact with him. He's now a doctor. Went to medical school at Harvard and everything. And now he's a doctor. Married the whole business. It was at the end of my career, basically. I did another year or something after that, a couple of years. But how important a moment that was in my life to see that boy stand up, educated just like you guys were in the American School of A, proud of his religion, proud of himself, never raised his voice to any, didn't raise his voice then, just 17 year old, fueled from the toes to the head with wisdom. That's what it came to wisdom. And I hope they listened. I spoke, I didn't speak to the superintendent, the high school principal after that, but I spoke to the art center director who was my very close friend. And I said, how'd you like that speech? He said, we're going to play about that. Yeah. Anyway, we did the Greek, we did the Greek play and the Greek community rose up. They just rose up to support. They gave Greek dinners for rehearsal dinners for the kids. They had a Greek music, musicians come in and play. They gave Greek food. It was, they were so delighted with that play. And the beauty of the play, of course, is it's a very deep, serious story about the importance of growing up, the, how Antigone supports her brothers that are dead and how Oedipus blinds himself because of what he's done. Everything that the community that hated the first play should have hated and they never knew it. I know, but is it weird that they shot down the bigamy one, but they didn't have a problem with him marrying his mother and killing his father. Yeah. I think no. they, if you put me in a court of law, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Right. But I'm, so then I don't know how to categorize that incident, but that was an example. When I say I learned more from the kids and they ever learned from me, there's the example. You are anticipating, you're anticipating probably how we should wrap things up, Richard, and I'll, we'll leave you some time to make any other comments that you wish to make if you had any thoughts coming into this, but you've said a couple of times that you feel like you've learned from the students. And I think your stories and examples demonstrate that. But nonetheless, we as students at that age are impressionable. We look up to and learn from our teachers a great deal if we're lucky. Do you have any advice that you would give if you look back on lessons like that, on things over your career? What would you tell kids who are just now getting into middle school and high school how do they go about achieving wisdom? If they're not lucky enough to be at the American School of the Hay, what advice would you give them if you feel yourself uh, bold enough to give advice based on everything that you've learned? Well, one, one thing for sure that bothers me in my life is that the two of you represent American people who at a young age, without you having any input into it, are put in situations where the people sitting on both sides of you in a classroom may come from one from Russia and one from Greece, or maybe an American kid whose father is Portuguese. And that has got to affect you positively. I, I believe it's got to have made an impression on you that an American kid in an American high school in Detroit or in Boston or in Miami here doesn't have. Why don't you do it? I would say to the young, why don't you do it when you get to be an adult? Judy works with international students, law students. Why? They come from all over the world to study law. Why don't they sit around the table and talk about how their countries and their parents and their grandparents, what values they have so that they can le learn from each other? Why give it up? What? And I would, in terms of the wisdom, I, you've got to learn from those other kids. You've, you've got to be open to that. The group of parents has said about the play, for example, you can't do it. They're not, you can move those parents from one country, the way you guys will move from one country to another country, another country, and they learn nothing. They go to the American store and buy the American food. They have American packages sent them, or British. I'm not just choosing the Americans because that's what I taught it. They carry the culture with them. There's nothing they want from the culture. I knew teachers at the American school who worked there 20 years who could only say three words in Dutch. And I think the wisdom is just, you've got to keep your eyes and ears open. You've got to be open. You are forced into it, luckily. But when you get to be your age, the two of you, and what you've done in your life, it's 
important to keep that open. That's the learn from the world you're in, in a crazy way. Learn from the world you're in. The, um, Judy and I belong to an organization here where we open our house to visitors to America. So we've had as in Armenians and we've had people who don't speak any language I don't, and in, in our house here and uh, all the time. We have it. And so for the two of you, we have a guest book. Someone told us once, watch have a guest book. We're a number six guest book now. And every visitor who comes to us, even if they come for lunch, before you leave, sign the guest book in your language. Because we have such wonderful things in there because that's the world. And I think you guys were very lucky to, at the young age, to see that, to see that world. Um, I, think, I think there's opportunity for a lot of the Americans in the United States to that they're sitting next to people from different countries more now, yes. or, but they don't look at it the same way. No, no. that's exactly the truth. And I'm sure, because you're speaking and I'm speaking as Americans, I'm sure there are Greeks who are absolutely don't understand at all that there is a culture that are open to other cultures. I know here a boy who was born in Puerto Rico does not, never tries any food that he doesn't know. What? If you go to somebody's house and they're Moroccan and they put Moroccan food in front of you, both of you, I know, you'd eat it. You wouldn't say, oh, I'm not. His words are, I'm not a fan of that. You've never seen it, never eaten in your life. You two guys know that's the truth is you've got to be open. You've got to be open. And going through high school with the two of you went through high school, those are the years where you're not sure who you are, right? Going I mean, it would be easier to eat poppages and pancakes. Yeah, but you did it. How opposed to African yeah. <laughs> You did it. And I don't know the wisdom. I, I, I say it again. I learned more from them. I, the stories that they would tell, how they got where they are, like that girl, Eileen, who was saved by the American army with a bear, a teddy bear, a doll in her hand. It's a, you can say, oh, what a terrible story. But in fact, it's a wonderful story. It's why you sat next to them in class. And I would give up teaching sometimes. You sit in the chair and say, go ahead, talk, talk. And what's it like having a mother who's from Tunisia and a father who's from Finland? And they go, oh my God, when they fight, oh, is it a fight? Anyway, I don't know, James. I think it's good advice for life and it's good advice for making better decisions, which is part of what we're trying to help people. Trying Trying to do. Yeah. If you think you know the answer, you might, but there's a good chance that you don't, and you're never going to learn. You're never, never going to learn. Never going to learn. So you got to be true to yourself. Let's put it that way. You got to be true to yourself. James just froze. Yeah, um, James froze. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good ending lesson there. Richard. You got to be true to yourself. And in high school, you're not sure who you are. That's just typical high school. When did you learn who you are? When you were 32? When you were 28? When did you learn? I mean, learn the next couple of years, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> You know, the famous, I'll end, the famous story about the man driving to work in New York City, stuck in the Lincoln Tunnel, and he says to himself, can I go me to work? I don't know. And the tunnel is stuck. Boy, what is the purpose of my life? What's the meaning of my life here? I mean, does God exist? What is the meaning of this? And in the car, he telephones his minister. I'm sitting in my car. What is the meaning of life? And the minister says to him, well, I really, I, I can only give you my idea. I'm not sure. But in Detroit, there's a very famous church with a very famous minister. And he, I'm sure, will know the meaning. The guy jumps out of his car, goes to LaGuardia, gets in a plane to Detroit, forgets his wife and his kids, goes to the church, goes to the minister and says, Sir, I'm in desperate need. What is the meaning of life? And the minister says, you know, this is one of the most important questions any person can ask themselves. And I don't know the answer, but there happens to be in India, a very famous Swami, and he really is in another realm of understanding. I would recommend to go ask him. He jumps in a plane, goes to India, tells his wife, and I'm sorry, honey, I just have to do this. Goes to India, finds the Swami. Sir, I'm here from New York. I was in my couch. What is the meaning of life? And the man, Swami says, that is the most important question. And I do not have the answer. But in Nepal, in the top of the mountains in Nepal, 
is a Swami who knows the meaning of life. The guy now leaves New Delhi, wherever he is, goes on the road, bi bicycles, buffaloes, and his clothes are rich. He, and he climbs up this mountain in the snow. And there in front of a cave with the sun shining around him is this old man. And he says to the old man, you are my only hope. You can tell me, sir, what is the meaning of life? And the Swami says, the meaning of life, my son, life is a fountain. And the man says, excuse me, I gave up my job, my wife, my children. I crossed the ocean. I flew here. I climbed up this mountain to have you tell me that the meaning of life is a fountain. And the Swami says, you mean it's not a fountain? That's it. That's it. Maybe it's not a fountain. All right. You guys are great. Yeah, Richard, thanks so much for coming on. It has been oh, no. a pleasure. I'd love to. We'll talk again. We'd love to hear what you think. So please comment on the show with your thoughts. We read all of your comments. Thanks for joining us. And thanks for subscribing. See you next time.